trying to brave the cold again. But uh, we're going to open our service with a word of prayer. Uh, Pastor Todd is away with his kid, kids <laughs> camping outside. So we'll think of that. So yeah, it's not my cup of tea either. And I don't like to be cold, hot either or cold. So which is better? Fine line. Anyway, let's uh, gather to worship and let's open our uh, service with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for bringing us all together. We want to worship you this morning, Father. We want to honor you in all that we say and do. We pray now, Father, that you will be with us as we lift our hearts to you. And we know that some of our family is uh, not well today. And I pray, Father, that you will be right beside them and lift them up, Father, and, and encourage them. And we pray now, Father, that as we enter into uh, this worship time with you, that you will be honored and glorified. We thank you for being here and just being right with us. And we know and want to thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. So we're going to start singing a song. If she clicks. <laughs> and so it's sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is a pattern for me. camera there's no anything so we're recording the service hopefully successfully we'll see if that works or not but um, I even tried to post a note on our Facebook page to say sorry technical difficulties this is me Natalie sorry and it won't even let me post anything so oh well anyway so I'll just apologize to everybody later, but. so we're just gonna roll with it we're gonna keep on going and uh, I, I think that sometimes you know the start of the year is these kinds of songs were in my mind. We did Count Your Blessings, I think, the first Sunday back. But um, to follow where God leads, that's an important thing. There's some of us that have big changes coming, and we're following where God is leading. There's, there's people that have little changes in our lives, maybe, and we need to take God's lead in our lives. And when we do that, we need to also have a willing heart to follow what He wants us to do. Lord, give me a willing heart. Oh, 
we have stuff going on in our church for sure. Please take a look at your bulletins. One thing I forgot to put in both last week and this week is that today we do have the senior service over at Mountain View Seniors Home. That's the right words. And uh, so we meet at 1.30 in the locked area, and then 2 o'clock is in the main area just off of their dining area. So if you're able to come out and just give some handshakes, hugs, and add your voice to some singing, um, they just love to have people come and visit. And so if you're able to come, we would love to have you there. Uh, Bob is going to share there as well. Um, and so we will have... It's mainly music. We usually sing for about 20 minutes, and then somebody talks for about five. So, <laughs> was, that, was that a hint? <laughs> Is that an advertisement? No, I'm not, no, it's all good. Um, <laughs> but um, if you're well, if you're able to come, we would love to have you out there. Um, Pastor Todd does get home this afternoon, so that's good. Uh, I'm imagining he's going to probably want a hot bath after a very cold weekend of camping with the cadets. Um, so he, I imagine, is going to do coffee on Tuesday, but I can't reach him because he's at a cell service range. And so um, if you're usually a coffeeer or teer on Tuesdays, chances are he'll be at the uh, Backwoods Cafe. Um, also, today we are going to be taking our alabaster offering. So that's what this box is up here. It's kind of a giant size of what's on your tables. If you don't have an alabaster box, please do take one home with you. There's a several more out on the um, table out in the foyer as well. And um, it's just a way that we can give. And, and it, it might be dimes, it might be quarters, it might be whatever, $100 bills. They all fit in there just nicely. And um, all of that money goes and it multiplies. It's amazing how it's like the feeding of the 5,000. When you give from your heart, it's amazing what the Lord can do with it. And so this goes to build houses, churches, hospitals, and many, many more things all around the world, even, even on our continent. It's not just across overseas, but it, it helps all over. And so we're going to sing a familiar tune with some different words. It's just two verses of Jesus Loves Me that have been rewritten for sort of a missions-minded thing. And if you have your alabaster offering, we ask that you come and just drop it in the box. Or um, if you forgot, it'll be here next week. So <laughs> you'll still have a chance. And I am going to show you a video, but I can't be in two places at the same time. So once we're done doing the march, I'm going to zip back and I'll show you the video and give Bob a chance to put his microphone on before he uh, leads in our sermon this morning. All right. Jesus loves them, do they know? Missionaries have a place to live. It's Jesus. Students have a place to it's study. Jesus. Families 
have a place to receive health care. And everyone has a place to learn about Jesus Christ. You have been a part of making this dream come true for people in need all over the world. The Nazarene Missions International Alabaster Offerings have raised over a hundred million dollars to fund building projects that have impacted countless lives. Certainly, a community is more than its buildings, but Alabaster projects help empower people by providing spaces to gather, learn, and live life together as the church. These permanent structures are a reminder to the community that the church isn't leaving. Give through the Alabaster offering this year and help build a better future as God works in building projects across the globe. Is that it? I'm just not too sure whether the wires are running in the right direction here. But. but apparently I'm on anyway, so even I can hear me. Well, we're going to look in uh, Luke chapter 15, so you may want to look it up. And See what you can find, because it's all about being lost, or something being lost. I looked, I use different versions, as you do, I'm sure, with all the different versions that we have available today. You remember the day when you used to have to carry them all in hard cover, and you had them stacked up if you were doing any personal study, and you were say, well, that's a King James, okay, but I can't quite understand that, so I'll grab the, the New Living, and, and, uh, and now we just flick into a U version here, and we can pick up 20 different versions if we want at any point. It's incredible, really. But I, I got a kick out of the way that this one started, and uh, uh, so just hold your finger in there for a minute. Um, Maybe let's just ask the Lord's help here. Father, thank you that we can share a little bit together now, and uh, I pray that as I present a thought or two here, that uh, whatever is of you would sink home in all of our hearts. We thank you for your presence here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I was thinking for a new name for Pastor Todd. Uh, we, after this weekend, we could call him Pastor Popsicle, maybe. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that, but uh, I was feeling sorry for him this morning when I was crawling into the hot shower, <laughs> and he was probably crawling out of his sleeping bag. Uh, oh, boy. Anyway, uh, a mother, I think I may have told this story to you before, but a, a mother said to her son who was drawing a picture, what, it, what is it that you're drawing? And, and uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she tried to straighten out his theology and say, you know, son, nobody really knows what God looks like. And he said, well, they will when I get finished. <laughs> so in a sense, that's what was happening here because in the NLT, it says, that's the New Living Translation, it says, the collectors and other notorious, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. <laughs> I had, I got a kick out of that. I don't know why I got, why do we put them in that category? Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Isn't that interesting? Wouldn't you think that tax collectors and other notorious sinners would have other things that were more exciting to do? But uh, in Luke 15, in the, in the um, let's see, this is the, this is the message. 
By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation, see, they fit into that same kind of thing, were hanging around Jesus, listening intently, and the Pharisees and religious scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled, he takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Can you imagine? Their grumbling triggered this story. So their grumbling about what what Jesus was like and what his lifestyle was like brought him to the place where he wanted to share this story with them. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until you found it? And when you found, when found, you can be sure you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing and when you got home, call in your friends and neighbors saying, celebrate with me, I found my lost sheep. Count on it. That's what you do. There's more joy. He said, count on it. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life than over 99 good people and no need of rescue. That wasn't to put down the good people, by the way, but that was to say, there's excitement when you find somebody who's lost. So then he went on and said, or imagine a woman who has 10 coins and loses one. Kathy, didn't you tell this story one time about the, were the coins on a, on a, they, they were like a, an engagement type of a thing and often worn on a band around the head. So when one was missing, it was missing. It's like having the front one front tooth gone, you know. Yeah, right. you'd get down and look for it, especially if it was gold, right? Won't she light a lamp and scour the house looking in every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, you can be sure she'll call her friends and neighbors, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. Don't you love that? Isn't that neat? Then he says, the third lost situation here. There was once a man who had two sons, and the younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country, and there, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. And after he'd gone through all his money, there was a bad famine. Murphy was at work then too, right? All through that country there was a famine and he began to hurt and he signed on with a citizen who, was a, who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop but no one would give him any. <coughs> Ooh, that brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. And when he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. Isn't that something? He was calling to the servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes, dress him, put the family ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, then get a grain-fed heifer <laughs> and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. Three lost items. Why was Jesus telling these notorious sinners and tax collectors about lost items. What was his point? Well, obviously, he wanted them to know something about his father. They had the wrong impression. They, here they were looking at Jesus, seeing Jesus as a teacher and prophet and someone who was going about doing good. Therefore, we need to cage him up and we basically want to control his behavior and we know how he should be acting and we're very disappointed in him. In fact, we're mad at him because he's, he's just compromising everywhere, taking in, eating with sinners, right? He said, let me tell you about my dad. Let me give you three stories to tell you about my father. My father's concerned and lovingly interested when anybody's lost. 
and he goes out of his way. I don't know if any of you have ever, can you picture taking a sheep and putting it over your shoulders? <laughs> I've had sheep. You can put the little ones over your shoulders, but you wouldn't care to put some of those big ones. No. Um, we won't go into sheep. He was telling those people, let me tell you something about my father. Let me draw you a picture that maybe you can understand. And when you see it, you'll have a new impression about God. Prodigal. We call that son the prodigal son. I looked up the word. I, I googled prodigal. And prodigal apparently is extravagant. It has a, it has a, a little bit of a um, connotation of being wasteful, but extravagant, just blow on the wad. And I thought, wait a minute here, it's almost like the father was the prodigal. He was just blowing the wad of love all over those, all over that kid. And, and you wonder which one really was the, the, the wasteful one here. Well, obviously, neither we know the prodigal son was way, wasteful. He really blew the blew the money and his reputation and everything that went with it, but his father waited to see him coming home. That's another whole sermon. We can talk about why sometime, why he didn't go looking for him. But I think sometimes uh, we, see lots, we see lots of pictures that God gives us the freedom to do what it is we want to do and waits and waits for us to run out of corn cobs and wake up, hit the wall, we talk about it. Have you, ever, have you never prayed for your kids, oh Lord, let them hit the wall, just not too hard, right? But let them hit the wall because they can't, if they keep going in the direction they're going, they're gonna wreck everything. And there's the father, and, the, and there's been a lot written, I, I would recommend you re look for books about, and stories about the prodigal son. Um, and the father, the father hitching up his robes and running to meet that kid coming down the road smelling like a pig and wraps his arms around that filthy little critter who, who embarrassed him to the eyes. Can you imagine those, those sinners and tax collectors thinking about that? What? He, he hugged him? Nobody, nobody we know of gives his kid his inheritance just because he asks for it. We, we can't imagine that kind of a earthly father doing that. And then runs and hugs him when he's coming home and throws a party. Man, they were getting a different picture, weren't they, of what God was all about because Jesus was telling them about his father. And if I draw the picture, they'll understand. They'll know what he looks like. Well, it's great to hear about God. Jesus knew they needed to hear about God, but, but he knew they needed to see him. Jesus came, said to John in John chapter 1, maybe uh, you, can, uh, you can follow me as I, as I uh, look up John chapter 1. It goes pretty quickly when you, when you try to do that in until you're trying to do it in a hurry, and then you can't find anything. Um, uh oh, <laughs> what I just did was I, I hit the, the wrong button, and now you're listening to the story. <laughs> Kathy's always saying to me, "Don't take that thing into the pulpit. You know, <laughs> you'll foul things up for sure." Uh, John one. And uh, we'll look at uh, verse 14. The Word, John says, became flesh. The Word became flesh and blood. I guess I'm still reading from, from the message. The Word became flesh and blood, moved right into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the, the one-of-a-kind glory like, like Father, like Son. Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and said, This is the one, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He's always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. And then it goes on to, to explain uh, about how the word was made flesh and moved right into our neighborhood. 
E. Stanley Jones said, Christianity puts a face on God. He said, Jesus is God's face. If you look at John 14, um, you can flip over to John 14, verse 8. We find a story about Philip, who is walking up to Jesus and he's saying, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. People wanted, people wanted to see God. What's God like? What's he look like? Show us the Father, then we'll be content. And Jesus said, you've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I just don't make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. We will never understand the mystery of the Trinity. We'll never be able to fully comprehend the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a relationship. They relate to one another and yet they are one. And I'm not going to go into explanations about how this kind of thing happened. People have tried three leaf clovers and ice water and, and steam and they've tried all kinds of things to say, let me try to explain the Trinity. Well, good luck with that. But we understand that's simply the truth of it. And so he could say to Philip, you've seen me and you still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. If you go back a few verses, um, let me think. You know, I tried, I tried typing on my, technology and I don't really get along. I was so excited when I got a new electric typewriter when I was in the pastoral, in the pastorate way back in 1966, I got a brand new, uh, electric typewriter, but I couldn't afford the one that you hit the button and the carriage went back on its own. It, it was electric in the keys, but I still had to slide it back. Remember that? I've literally, I've thrown that out. I've kind of regretted that because there are times when I think, oh, that was so simple. Anyway, Jesus said, don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you trust me? There's plenty of room for you in my father's home. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get a room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live and you already know the road I'm taking. Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do, how do you expect us to know the road? Jesus said, I am the road, right? I am the road. I am the truth. The men are getting together. Some of the men are getting together those who can get up early enough. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, and uh, we, we are talking about truth. And what, a, what an incredibly interesting subject. And what an incredibly captivating subject because truth is what we operate in. And when we follow Jesus, we follow the truth. And truth and trust, and, and uh, they, they just go together. And Jesus said, I'm the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Wow. Well, the world today is increasingly soured at religion. Um, I just heard today that, that uh, maybe you heard context this morning. We sometimes flip around to different Christian programs as we're getting ready. We've watched one or two sermons already, so Kath doesn't really need this one. <laughs> so, but on uh, context, they're talking about today there's a million, there's a million Christians um, being persecuted in China and something, or no, six million in China and a thousand Muslims being persecuted. The world is full of people that are persecuting Christians 
they're skeptical, they're critical, they're suspicious, and maybe partly, maybe part of that is due to the fact that Jesus has not, because they don't know what Jesus really looks like. Maybe they've never really come in touch with Jesus. Maybe they've never really seen the picture. Maybe that's what makes a lot of people skeptical of Christianity. Because there's a lot of Christianity talked about, and there's a church on every corner. And, well, there's a, on almost every corner, even here in Sundry. And right now, this morning, there's probably in this whole area of how many people, 5,000 people in this great area, there's probably just a matter of a few hundred. They're gathering like we are gathering this morning. Um, is it any wonder maybe that people are skeptical about religion and about Christianity because maybe they haven't really seen a good picture of Jesus? And I guess one of my prayers is that, that somehow or other, despite me and my faults, that somehow people around me, dealing with me, talking with me, living around me, living with me, would somehow get a glimpse of Jesus. Paul said to the Colossians uh, in chapter 1, and maybe you can look that up real quickly because this is, a, this, this is sort of the verse I wanted to leave with you this morning or the truth I wanted to, to take a quick look at. In uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25, I want you, verse 24 says, I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. There's a lot of suffering to be entered into this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. Let me just change this to the NLT. Um, let me look up, go up here to 25 and uh, I think I have it highlighted one of the neat things you can do. This includes, so he's he says, yet now he has reconciled you to himself. Here he is talking to the, Col the people in Colossae. Colossae is, <laughs> Coloss yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's verse 22. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to, pro to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. Now, this message was kept secret. Ah, now your ears perk up. There's a secret. We all love a secret, don't we? This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. That includes us. And this is the secret. You're all sitting on the edge of your seat. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. Christ lives in you. Whew. I mean, take that in. How does that happen? Well, how did it happen in your life? In, in Revelation, John said, uh, Jesus is standing at your heart's door knocking. If any man... Hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. So if Jesus is in you, it's because you opened the door. Right? And we find in different areas in Scripture, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will, you will be saved. Right? Believing, opening the door, saying, come on in. Um, and what's Olstein say? Make Jesus your Savior. <laughs> you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you open the door. We tend to talk a lot about Jesus in my heart, but do you know there's only one place in Scripture that, said, that talks about Jesus in your heart? Specifically, just one place. I'm not saying that, it, that therefore that's not important. It is, 
But isn't it interesting that so much of what we talk about, I've asked Jesus into my heart, I've asked Jesus into my heart. Asking God the glorious Father in Ephesians 1, 17, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom that, and insight so that you might grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Oh, that's okay. Depends on what translation you're reading, but it talks about he's in your heart. But five times in Scripture, five different times, he talks about Christ in you, Christ lives in you, no, I kept losing things on, my, on that computer last night. Here it is. Five references to Christ in me. <laughs> so there's one about Christ in our heart reference in Scripture. There's one. There's five about Christ um, being in us. There's 165 references to our being in Christ. So being in Christ, Christ in me, Christ in my heart. Where is he? He's in here. You know, that makes us look at some of the things we say and some of the, even some of the songs we sing. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, Well, we have this treasure, Christ, in an earthen vessel. That's why counselors are kept busy. That's why I have been sweating it out for 27 years down the road, because, because there's so many earthen vessels around. You know what that means, a clay pot which means most of us are kind of battered, bruised, and cracked. <laughs> and, sorry, if you're, sorry if you're offended. But it often has to do with the way we were raised, the homes we were, we were raised in. None of us got to pick our parents, you know, and for the most part, they didn't get to pick us either, unless you are fortunate enough to be adopted. Um, and then they took a look at you and said, yes, we're taking you home, right? Um, so most of us have a background that has somehow cracked, chipped, split, given our clay pot, our earthen vessels, some hassle along the way. But we now hold this treasure in this vessel. That's one of the reasons why sometimes church boards don't always get along with one another. And I said, I'll never belong to another. No, I did. not quite that way. <laughs> that's, that's often why you hear about splits in church. It's because earthen vessels get in the way, you know. And we have to keep reminding ourselves, who are we? We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We need to listen up. We need to tune in. We need to realize we're joined to him. We're joined to him. He says in Galatians 2.20, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It no longer is I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how I live. That's how you live. That's how we live. By trusting Christ who lives in us. And one, tra one translation of King James even suggests that we live by the faith of the Son of God. And that's the way that whole group translated that scripture. Not we live by trusting in him, but we live by by his faith, by the faith of Christ, well, we can't pull that apart, really. Doyle Lawson, one of my favorite bluegrass musicians, says, oh, I gotta read, I gotta read the words of the song. I, I saved you the embarrassment of listening to me sing it this morning, but he says, and I thought two weeks in a row with bluegrass up there might be more than what some of you could take. But he said, I'm not just myself, although I look the same. The portrait that I used to be is in a different frame. I feel this sudden strength, but I'm as helpless as a child, and you may see me grinning like it's going out of style. The things I used to treasure just got in the way. The people I once hated, I love them more each day. The frown I'm used to wearing has been turned upside down since Jesus came into my heart and turned my life around. He lives in me. He lives in me. He bought me with a price. Now I no longer am my own. My life is his kingdom. My heart is his throne. He lives in me. He lives in me. The king of all heaven and earth is living in us. I mean, if that isn't enough to make you shout, I don't know what is. 
That's good news. That's why we call it the good news, right? Not even when I'm tempted, good, and, and not even when I'm tempted, good and evil are at war. The battle's getting hotter than it's ever been before. Oh, I know where my strength lies. I can't do it on my own. Then I get reinforcements because I'm never left alone, right? Isn't that what Jesus promised? You are never alone. He lives in me. He lives in me. Google Doyle Lawson. He lives in me. Stand back. Turn your speakers up. <laughs> Enjoy some good music. Okay. Because he's in me, I'm a new creature, says Paul to the Corinthians. First, first Corinthians, I think it was the second Corinthians 5.17. Uh, I'm a new creature in Christ. Behold, all things are, old things are passed away, all things have become new. Because he lives in me, therefore I act differently than I used to act, right? Because he's in me, I've been transformed, said Paul to the Romans. Be transformed by changing the way you think. So if he lives in me, I think differently. Oh, I'm still in time. I can preach for another half. <laughs> I've been transformed, says Paul. Be transformed by changing the way you think. Well, we can change the way we think because he's living in here. And his Holy Spirit is constantly guiding us into truth. You know, I, I've talked about, before when I had the privilege of being up here, talked about the, the, uh, the world that we're living in today is a, a world of distraction. Uh, it, it's getting us off key all the time. There's always so many things to think about that they even have to remind us, don't drive with your eyes on this thing. You're going to kill yourself or somebody else, right? And it's also because, you know, I, I, I chuckle, at, they allow all these road signs, and now they're making road signs fluorescent and changing pictures. And then put a sign up, don't drive distracted. <laughs> Right? I mean, it's ridiculous. But we are distracted on every side, and it's easy for us in the midst and the hustle and bustle of life and the stresses of life to forget who's in here, who's in me. And the only way we're going to be able to remember is to, is to take some time, and I'm not up here preaching quiet time and trying to make anybody feel guilty. I don't care whether it's two minutes, one minute, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I read these sermons about these fellows that used to preach four and five hours, or at least pray four or five hours a day, and I get deeply under conviction and greatly guilty, and then I think, nonsense. That's nonsense. God was asking them to do that. He's not asking me to do that. And they didn't live in 2019 and drive a car down the highway, right? You, we just live at different times. We can't throw that guilt on one another, but what I'm saying to you is if you don't take some time to shut everything down, whether it's in the car with no noise, whether it's in the closet or in your bed, if you don't take some time to listen and think, then you're just bound to make mistakes, bigger mistakes than we usually make, right? And we are all prone to making mistakes. Because he's in me, I've been transformed because he changes the way I think. He's in me, so I pray differently. Uh, I, I remember 40 years ago hearing Reuben Welch out of, uh, out of Kansas City, who was a great Nazarene preacher way back and author, to say, we don't have to pray. Oh, God, come and be with me. Where do you think he went? He's here. Right? You know, I'm sorry, and, and uh, Natalie, I was going to say about the songs that we sang this morning. It's funny, as we sing some of those songs, we're, we're asking God to do things that he's already done. We, we need to somehow change the way we think about that so our hearts are full of thank yous instead of, oh, please. Because he said, I'll never leave you alone. We're, we're so prone to say, Lord, come and be with us when we maybe should be saying, Lord, I'm so grateful that you're here, right? And, and that is a change in our thinking. 
No matter where we are, he's with us, right? So in the midst of child problems, if you got any, you got problems. I mean, if you got any, <laughs> or if you got any problems, you got children. <laughs> if, if, you know, or grandchildren. And it's wonderful to have little kids here, isn't it, today? Maybe we just need to rethink some of the ways that we pray. Understanding that he's here. You know, we sang, search me, uh, O oh God. And we know that he's constantly, not searching us, but with us and tapping us on the shoulder, as it were, guiding our thinking and helping us with our decisions. And so we don't have to arrive saying, okay, now, now, Lord, look inside and see if there's anything ugly in there. We know there's something ugly in there because the Holy Spirit's been faithfully reminding us. <laughs> Smarten up, right? Um, I'm sorry, that may be... We, we, we put bracelets on or things on our hats saying WWJD, you know. What would Jesus do? Well, we know what Jesus... What we need to say, Lord, Lord, show me what you're doing right now because I want to get in on it. Maybe I'm missing it, you know. So maybe instead of WWJD, it should be WWAD. Um, what would, no, I, I'm losing my alphabet here. It should say something about, what are you doing, Lord? W-A-D, yeah, W-A-D-L, what are you doing, Lord? I, I just read a little funny about a guy who walked into the, the shop where they were selling hats and he saw a hat up there that said WWJD and he said, what's that mean? And the fellow said, well, it means what would Jesus do? And the guy took it down and he said, looked at it and he said, well, I know one thing Jesus wouldn't do is buy this hat, it's too expensive. <laughs> so, anyway, that was not part of my sermon. <laughs> so what does God look like? What does Jesus look like? Are we painting a picture? Yes, we're painting a picture. We are inadvertently or on purpose or accidentally. Every day we live, <laughs> all the time, we are painting a picture. Our prayer, Lord, help people to see in my picture your kindness, your love, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. Help them to see that in my picture so that like Jesus saying to the tax collectors and other sinners, when whoever were around, if you stick around with me, you'll get a glimpse. We don't want to say that to people because they'll say, oh, who do you think you are, right? So maybe I need to sneak up on them a little bit. But those who are closest to you, they know who you are. And they're the ones, if they love you, can tap you on the shoulder and say, I think you smudged your portrait. <laughs> I think that's a real mark, a real, you tore your picture. And they love us so much, they can uh, encourage us to get the scotch tape out or something. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin, continues to cleanse from all sin, right? And he helps us to keep our portrait looking healthier and healthier and more and more like him all the time. So let's pray. And maybe just before I begin to pray, are there, are there folks this morning who would like to say, Bob, pray about this or that, or would maybe want to join me in prayer? I can't hear you. But, but. Sounds like a good move, good stuff. And uh, Carol is reminding us this morning that she has a, um, someone in their extended family has just uh, passed away and the funeral is today. And uh, so we need to pray for that family. And uh, just wanna thank the Lord for the opportunity to be here today. Father, it is so good to gather with our friends uh, to be able to share the love of Jesus with one another and to be reminded sometimes by one another or by reading your word 
just how wonderful you are. And Father, we, we re read today how even 2,000 years ago, the same concern was on your heart that people would have a healthy picture of you. And here we are, Father, the products of your love. You have changed our lives. You've given us hope. You've given us new life. And we, uh, we gather here this morning redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and uh, rejoice in that fact. And we pray that you would guide our thinking through this day, keep us mindful of your presence with us, and remind us, Father, if there's something we need to hear from you, that we take a little time to just to especially tune out the world so that we can, we can hear the still small voice faithfully speaking to us. We pray, Father, for Nikki as she takes an, another step of journey in her life toward uh, healthiness in every way. And we pray for Carol's family today, especially those down south uh, who are attending uh, and the friends and neighbors and folks that have known this lady as they attend that funeral, we pray that your presence would be felt and known and that the name of Jesus would be honored there today and that you would comfort those who are hurting. We thank you for your love today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now there's a song I wanted us to close with and, uh, and uh, the ladies are going to help us and the ladies and gentlemen. It's a hymn in the book that you probably have sung before, but maybe not for a long time. controlling all in all I do and say. Mm -hmm. 